Welcome everyone to our first AZ Bio Peer session of 2023. AZ Bio is celebrating 20 years of making an impact in Arizona and kicking off its third decade. Um, we are thrilled today to have Gail Freudinger from Cardinal Health um, for our first AZ Bio Peer session of 2023. And with that, I will turn it over to Gail. Great. Thanks, Joan. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining today. Uh, in Arizona Bios Regulatory Series Part 1, we're going to be discussing drug development and covering the U.S. regulatory overview and all the guidelines that apply uh, regulatory-wise to drug development. Um, my name is Gail Freudinger. I'm with Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences. I'm a business development director. I'm located in Oceanside, California. I've been in the industry about 30 plus years. Um, my background is primarily servicing and working with research uh, organizations, particularly as it relates to biotech. I've also worked with the mid-sized pharma, large pharma, and the med device and med tech companies. Um, my experience draws all the way back uh, from the data development days, uh, providing more everything on the commercialization side, and then I worked my way through the drug development process. So I've covered all aspects of drug development at this stage, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak with all of you today. I just have a couple housekeeping things. If you don't mind uh, waiting till the end to ask questions, and if there isn't time to get your question answered, my contact information is at the end of this presentation, which will be provided to you. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. And I've also got a nice list of resources and uh, tools and areas that you go to to get your questions answered related to regulatory. So hopefully you'll find this information useful. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And so here is our agenda for today. We're going to go through an overview of the drug approval process, and this is just to explain where the regulatory guidelines fit in. And then from there, we're going to be talking about the timelines for submitting each of the regulatory documents and how long it takes and what's involved in the preparation um, and when you'll receive approval from the FDA. In addition, we're going to discuss the costs that are involved with preparing regulatory documents and getting all the information together to the FDA, including the FDA fees. And then lastly, we're going to talk about what pitfalls you can avoid. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just get started with a little quiz here. Um, and this number changes every year, but I don't know if you all know how much it costs to develop a drug. Um, is it 700 million, 1.8 billion, 2.6 billion? If you guess 2.6 billion, you're about right. Now, of course, this amount varies depending on the size of the company and the type of drug that you're developing and what work's already been done, you know, perhaps passed with the company. However, developing new prescription medicine, according to uh, Tuff Center and the Journal of Health Economics, it takes about $2.6 billion to develop a drug um, and get it marketed. And so that's a lot of money. You don't want to, you can't really afford to have any issues with that. So uh, doing the regulatory due diligence that you need to do up front, getting things right the first time is extremely critical so that you can keep the cost to a minimum. So here's the drug approval process. And this slide is actually from the FDA. So this is how the FDA looks at the drug approval process. So you have early drug development where you have your target identifications and you end up with a lead optimization, your preclinical studies, your in vivo, your in vitro studies, um, maybe your animal studies or animal study alternatives here, uh, clinical development and your phase one, phase two, phase three human trials. And then once all that is done, the FDA is going to review your documents if you're planning to go commercial with your drug. And then from there, you have your post-market monitoring and surveillance. We're going to go through all the areas that are highlighted in red, and those are the areas that involve regulatory and the FDA. Um, there are three primary divisions of the FDA for purposes of developing a drug. Um, the first one is the Center for Drug Evaluation 
and Research, also known as CEDAR. And then the second one is the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Um, and then the third one is the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and that's known as CBER. Uh, the FDA is a very large organization. They're headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, they have a host of regional centers throughout the country. Um, for each of these divisions, there are regulatory, functional, and therapeutic areas of focus. And I have included in my resources a list of the organizational charts for um, the CEDAR and CBER divisions, which are the most commonly used divisions within the FDA for drug development. And then that way you can see who you need to contact. Having relationships with the FDA um, is important. If you have any uh, relationships that you can cultivate or, or know someone who works within the therapeutic area that you work in, that's very helpful. Um, rapport with the FDA in general during drug development is extremely helpful. Um, regulatory strategy really needs to begin at the earliest stage. Developing a regulatory strategy up front is positively critical. Uh, and the main purpose of having a really well-defined regulatory strategy is to streamline your drug development process. You really want to make sure that you're heading down the path that's going to be the most economical for the resources that you have in-house and makes the most sense for your drug and where you want to go. And as you can see here from our little cartoon, uh, you know, antibiotic, furniture polish, which way would you want to go? Um, so choosing the right stra regulatory strategy can be tricky. Sometimes you might want to develop your own and run it by somebody. Um, there are regulatory experts out there that can help review your strategy, have worked with the FDA, know how they might react, can help you vet through the strategy a little bit and figure out uh, what might be a, the best route for you based, again, on your resources. So getting back to our drug approval process chart again, if you will, um, now that you've, let's say, started your early de drug development and you've done some of your lead optimization, you've developed a regulatory strategy, you know the direction you want to go, you feel there's a target market for such a place, um, and then you've started some of your preclinical studies and maybe now you're wrapping those up, it's time to start thinking about a pre-IND meeting, and the IND application. And this is going to be the first stage where the FDA gets involved um, in your drug development process. And this is really opening up your rapport with the FDA for what your intention is, uh, whether you're going to do maybe research or you're going commercial and what you're planning to do in terms of, of the drug and the indication and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the IND process as a whole, because this is pretty critical. And uh, just in my job where I help clients with regulatory all the time, we get a lot of questions about the pre-IND and IND meetings. So I'm going to hopefully answer some of your questions related to this. So what is an IND? It's basically the investigational new drug application. And again, this is required for permission. So you've done your, your preclinical pieces. And before you can do your clinical pieces, you have to have an IND application submitted to the FDA. So this is right before you're going to start testing in humans in the U.S. And um, the FDA uh, doesn't really do what we call a approval letter. They'll give you a letter telling you your IND is open, which that's the good sign. That's the sign you're looking for. Um, you, If you don't receive a letter after 30 days from the FDA after you've submitted your application, uh, you might want to call them. I would highly recommend that before you would start a clinical trial, um, just to make sure. Sometimes uh, they take a little longer than 30 days, but you can go ahead and proceed after 30 days. Um, if you get uh, a no, if you will, that means that the FDA has notified you that your drug or your program, if you will, is on clinical hold. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And so there are two IND categories. There's what we call the commercial IND, and that's 
if you're planning to bring your drug to the market in the United States. So commercial marketplace, you're going to do a commercial IND. If you're more on the academia side um, or, you know, working with a particular hospital, for example, you might uh, be working at a research IND, and that's going to, you won't be bringing your drug commercial, but you will be going through the IND process so that you can test uh, your drug on humans. So that's the two IND categories. And then we have three IND types. The first one is what we call an investigator IND, and that's um, research is submitted by the investigator uh, they initiate, they conduct the study. And then the second one is the emergency IND. And I think if you've uh, experienced COVID as we all have, you saw a lot of the tests and so forth coming out, new drugs coming out to treat COVID. And they were experimental drugs, but because we were in a pandemic, we had to get them out quickly. So that's an example of an emergency IND. And then there is also the treatment IND or exploratory IND. Um, and that's really access for subjects who are like in a serious or life-threatening uh, illness. And you need to get a drug to treat them right away. And you, you're really close and have some good promise in the early clinical testing. And now you want to test it on humans. So those are the three IND types. Okay, so here's an example, and this is from um, our company, Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences, of an IND success. So you would receive a letter like this that would say your IND, we've looked at it, it's open, and then you can see here the FDA is even offering a couple comments for consideration. So that's some advice and some guidance for the FDA, and they're, they're telling you, giving you some next steps and things to take into consideration. Now, if an IND is opened by the FDA, your responsibility as a sponsor or, you know, I am manufacturer, if you will, is to agree to keep the IND current. So you've opened your IND, you're not done. You have to keep everything current. So the things that the FDA is going to be looking for are any safety issues that might come up during your clinical trials. They're going to want to be notified of that. Um, any annual reports you have to file. So the trial has been going on for maybe a year or two. You have to summarize that information in an annual report and submit that to the FDA. And then sometimes there are amendments or changes. Perhaps you've changed the dosing, the development of the formulation. Uh, the protocol for the clinical trial, all of those are considered amendments and have to be submitted and maintained with the IND. So all that is back and forth with the FDA. And then lastly, when the clinical study uh, ends, you have to notify the FDA. Okay, so we talked about a clinical hold. What is a clinical hold? So a clinical hold means the study can't proceed because there's been some questions or issues raised by the FDA that need to be resolved first. I'm not necessarily something you want to have happen, so uh, hopefully this can be avoided by uh, carefully putting together your IND submission. But according to the FDA, the most common reasons for a clinical hold um, that can be anything from like product quality issues, uh, you know, the clinical concerns and how the trials being planning to be conducted. Uh, it could be toxicology. So these top, these are the top three uh, reasons for a clinical hold. And then lastly is the manufacturing process. So if you're developing like a cell and gene therapy or anything in the advanced therapies, such as a CAR T and you're going into a patient and you're maybe taking something out of the tissue of an ulcer or a, a cancerous tumor, and then you're, you're taking it out and bringing it over to a manufacturing facility and, and adjusting it, washing it and treating it, and then putting it back into the patient. That whole process is part of the manufacturing process and it gets really tricky. And so you wanna make sure uh, that you outline that and show, you know, that everything is sanitary and that there's no contamination and that, uh, you know, all of this is going to work okay. So the, the advanced therapies guidelines 
uh, tend to be changed quite often with the FDA. They're still uh, developing ways of trying to figure out the best way to make sure that that's safe and efficacious for patients. Okay, so let's just talk about the IND before we get into the pre-IND meeting. Uh, these are the modules that are included in an IND, and it can be overwhelming and cumbersome. If you're a smaller biotech and you're developing a drug, um, you might be collecting a lot of the preclinical information, but you know, putting it in the right format for the FDA when you submit it to your IND um, is a little cumbersome. And also, you want to really think about the modules and where the documents need to be placed and what needs to be contained within that IND. So again, here's another chance where maybe uh, you're going to be presenting to the FDA, but you want to have everything done correctly. So if you need another set of eyes to review it, sometimes you need help writing it, sometimes you need help submitting it, um, you know, you might want to go to an expert to help you here. And just so you know, the um, commercial INDs need to be in an ECTD format, and that's what we call a common technical document. Um, you have to have hyperlinks for all your references. Everything has to be in a certain format. Um, and I've included in the resources uh, a, it's like a cheat sheet. It's like uh, common things to look for and, and things to avoid within an ECTD submission. So, uh, you know, work closely with a publishing and submission company. If you don't have those capabilities, uh, make sure to allow plenty of time to get everything into the right format. And just to quickly discuss the contents here. So you've got your manufacturer, you've got your, your module one, which really isn't part of the ECTD format, but it's got all your forms. It's got your investigational plan, um, your investigator's brochure and so forth. Your investigational label, you have to label your, your drug for the clinical trial. Um, and then you have Module two is really just summarizing modules three, four, and five. So module three is going to be your largest module. And that is uh, really the whole chemical manufacturing control. All your CMC information is going to go in there. So you've got your drug formulation. Um, you've got anything about the drug product listed in there, et cetera. And then for module four, you've got your non-clinical information. So here you're gonna have non-clinical studies. And then you can also use a, a lot of literature. Uh, if you're doing a 505B2, for example, and the drug's already been launched in the market um, and you're just kind of modifying it in some way, you could use uh, literature from the existing drug. So if you work with like a regulatory specialist here, that would be helpful because they can tell you how to integrate the literature that will best benefit you here um, in terms of the eyes of the FDA. And then lastly is the clinical section. Now this module, module five, is not gonna be very large here usually because you are using the IND to get in a clinical study going. So if you've done studies in other countries, you'd want to include them here. Um, if you have any information, uh, maybe again, you're doing a 505B2 and the drug's already out there in the market and you'd like to use some of that clinical literature, here's an opportunity to present it. But overall, module five, this clinical module will be a little lighter than the rest. Okay, that was a lot to cover, but I think uh, we're okay on, on time so far. So the pre-IND meeting. Do you do it? Do you not do it? I've had several people uh, try not to do it. And I will tell you that we highly recommend that you do the pre-IND meeting. Um, and this is why. The main reason why is that you're given an opportunity to get feedback from the FDA and you want that feedback. Um, the FDA can give you great advice, next steps to take, things to consider, and it's really going to help shape your next stages of the clinical trials and ultimately if you're going commercial your NDA so getting that feedback is really important. Um, this also allows you to present your regulatory strategy to the FDA um, and you know give them some insight as to what you're thinking as a company and to ask 
questions. You know, am I on the right track? Should I consider something else? You know, um, some details about maybe the CMC or how you want to file it um, based on what your knowledge is. And they're experts in the therapeutic area. They know all the drugs that have been through there. So it's a great chance to, to uh, get that information. So I highly recommend the pre-IND meeting. And so here's a question that I often get is, well, how long does the pre-IND meeting take? And do I have time to do that? And, and how long does it take to prepare for the pre-IND meeting? So if you look at the top of this timeline, you can see uh, the, the letters in red, and that's the regulatory pieces. So that's how the FDA views their guidelines of what the timeline should be. And then the below part underneath the line in purple is the sponsor's responsibility. So once you've submitted the letter to the FDA saying, I, I would like to have a pre-IND meeting request, they have in their guidelines 21 days to respond to you and say, your meeting's been granted and here's the date. And that date's going to be uh, 60 days from the date that you submitted that they they get back to you. So when you submit your IND pre I excuse me your pre IND meeting request letter, you want to have about 80% of your IND already prepared because you need to have that IND uh, or pre IND package prepare. So you want to have that done 30 days before your meeting. The FDA is going to require that so they have time to review your pre-IND package before the pre-IND meeting. So again, 21 days after you submit your pre-IND meeting request, you're going to hear from the FDA and they're going to grant you a meeting. It's going to be 60 days out. 30 days before that, you have to have your pre IND package ready to go. Once all the meeting has occurred, and most of the meetings now are done via correspondence, um, you can also request a virtual meeting or a teleconference, but in-person meetings since COVID are, are fairly rare. Um, and once the meeting occurs, uh, you'll have meeting minutes that will be provided by the FDA 30 days later, and uh, you can take those meetings and then incorporate it into your IND and IND strategy, if you will, for preparing that. Um, so know that these are guidelines from the FDA and some of the groups within the FDA, like the anesthesiology department, for example, they're slow and they may not work along these timelines. So allow extra time and build this into your timeline for your IND as a whole. Okay, so now that you know the pre-IND and the pre-IND path, if you will, um, we've gotten to the point where the FDA um, has their pre-IND minutes and they've provided those back to you. Um, you. You know, about 60 to 120 days is when your IND submission should be ready to go. And after the FDA receives your IND submission and they've reviewed it, they're going to have 30 days to say your IND is in effect. And like I said, sometimes they don't get back to you right away to tell you your IND is open. So 30 days after you've submitted that IND, you may call the FDA and say, may I move forward with my clinical trials? And again, this would be where you would get the clinical hold letter if, if that's the case. Okay, so... This is probably one of the most common questions that I get is how long does it take to prepare an IND? And, you know, this really varies. It depends on how much work you might already have done in-house and how much support you have in-house to do the work. But you, you want to really allow for probably a total of a year in the whole scope of prep for, for preparing for an IND. Um, you can actually do... Uh, like a pre-IND meeting can usually be prepared and, and turned around in a month or two. But, you know, you you're waiting on the FDA to respond. So that needs to be built into your preparation timeline. Um, but writing, compiling, reviewing, all those pieces have to be done. You also have to allow time for the actual submission and putting in, in the ECTD format. So these are all things that you want to take into consideration. Um, there's a submission map that you can usually get from the publishing group that you work with that will tell you all the documents and what's been done and, and you can work out the timelines. I would highly recommend that you 
put together a team that's either your internal resources or external regulatory resources that can help you and or maybe it's a combination of both and you have a non-clinical person and a clinical person and a CMC person and a regulatory affairs person all involved in this team and you work through when do you want to submit the IND and then work backwards along your timeline to determine you know when's the best time to get started what pieces are due when who's doing what and so forth and you want to bring publishing into that as the documents are getting ready. Okay, so back to the drug approval process. Um, here we have completed, if you will, the early drug development process, the preclinical studies. Um, we've done our pre-IND meeting and our IND application has been submitted and we've got an open IND. So now you can move forward with any in human or clinical development studies that you would like to proceed with. Now, if you start doing like phase one, phase two studies and you're noticing that maybe there's a need to change the dosing or something along those lines, um, you want to do what they call an end of phase two meeting with the FDA to discuss how that phase three clinical trial is going to work. If you're doing a brand new drug, uh, meaning it's never been out in the marketplace, definitely want to do an end of phase two meeting. If you're doing a 505B2 or a drug that's already been out there marketed, you may not need to do this uh, end of phase two meeting. So this is something that's really more up to you um, unless you're hearing from the FDA that they want to be involved in that phase three clinical trial uh, kind of beforehand. So this is the end of phase two meeting, and we're just going to quickly talk about the timelines here, very similar to the pre-IND meeting. So you're going to submit your request to the FDA. I'd like to have an end of phase two meeting. And then what you're going to do is hear from them in 14 days saying we've granted you the meeting, and the meeting is going to be probably 70 days from now. Um, and so then about 50 days beforehand, you're going to be sending a document to the FDA of what you want to talk about at your end of phase two meeting. And then after you have the meeting, the FDA is going to respond to you with their meeting minutes. And that will shape the next stage of your phase three clinical trial or study. Now, the end of phase two meeting purpose for the FDA is really, in their minds, you're determining the pathway for proceeding with the phase three study. You're evaluating that phase three plan and the protocol to make sure it's accurate based on, you know, the results that you've seen to date so far. Um, if there's, you know, uh, pediatrics involved, there's safety and effectiveness that have to be looked at there. And, you know, really the FDA wants to make sure that everybody involved in the clinical trial is going to be safe and that no one's really going to be hurt in any way, um, that everything is going to be reported correctly, et cetera. So uh, this is a meeting, again, kind of optional, but important, particularly if you're developing a new drug. Okay, so you've completed your phase three studies. Uh, or you're just about to complete them. If you're doing a research IND, your, your part is done. You're not moving forward now with going commercial. But if you are going commercial, you have to start thinking about the NDA. And the NDA is another huge document in the ECTD format that you're going to be submitting to the FDA. And the NDA um is has the option of a pre nda meeting as well before you put together your nda package you're going to want to have your drug labeling all completed so during the drug labeling process that's going to include your drug label how it's prescribed and then you're going to have your package insert for the physicians um, and the pharmacists and all that information outlined 
So let's just let's talk about the NDA a little bit because it's it's different than the IND. The IND is in the drug development process before we're doing a clinical trial, asking, if you will, can we apply to do a clinical trial? The NDA is at the end of the process, and it's really um, the basis that the FDA uses to control how to regulate new drugs in the United States, how to determine which drugs are safe enough to be marketed you know for patients to use and so the whole purpose of the nda is to get this marketing application if you will um now whether the drug is safe and effective is going to be one of the key proponents that the fda is going to be looking at within the nda um, and the labeling and the package insert and what it should contain is going to be key because if you think about it it all kind of gets down to that package insert, right? That's got all your contraindications. It's got exactly how the drug should be used. It's got how it should be prescribed. It's got all the information about the dosing and, and so forth. And you've seen, of course, a lot of the commercials and ads out there that have all the little caveats at the end, don't do this, it could cause that. All of that information really comes from the NDA. And that's the summary of everything possible about this drug that we know today. And uh, one more thing I just want to mention here is the manufacturing again. So in the NDA, the manufacturing and the CMC section is another very large section. It's really going to talk about all the methods that are used, you know, the quality, the purity, um, the strength, and so forth you know how the drug is manufactured is it in a stable environment uh what's the facility like so forth okay so here's four variations of the nda okay so the first one and i've, I've talked about these a little bit the first one is what we call the 505b1 and that's when you have a completely new drug that you're marketing and then the second one is the 505b2 so the 505B2 is probably one of the more common um, types of NDAs, and that's a variation on an existing drug. So it could be like a new indication for the drug. It could be like a new dosage form for the drug. It could be a new formulation or strength. So maybe either, you know, there was a pill and you're making it stronger and it's going to be used for a different indication, or maybe it was a pill and now you're going to make it a patch and it's going to be sustained released. Um, and it when you're working with a drug that's already been marketed and you're making a twist on it, you have to do that scientific bridge between the two drugs to show my drug is like this drug in some ways and then not in others and show uh, a lot of documentation of what's out there for the existing drug already. So if you're doing a 505B2 and you're working with a, like a regulatory expert, they can actually help you figure out which literature to leverage here that would be in the best interest uh, for sub submitting your NDA. Okay, the other form or type of NDA is what we call an ANDA. Um, this is in a generic version of an existing drug. So there's a drug out there and you're going for the generic version. Now, this is one of the more simpler NDAs that you can submit because there's already a drug out there existing in the marketplace. You can use a lot of literature here. Um, but, you know, some of the disadvantages from a regulatory strategy point might be that, you know, you're not going to really have any exclusivity um, and it's a me too drug, if you will. And we'll talk a little bit about comparing these in just a minute. Um, lastly, what we have is the BLA. And the BLA is a biologic or biosimilar. And um, there's also uh, the biosimilar, which is a generic biologic. So the BLA has a little bit different of a timeline and uh, the guidances are, are just a little bit different there. Okay, so I was talking about comparing these. So if you look on the left hand side of this comparison chart, you'll see that there are key allowances, you know, which one has a new chemical entity, which one has a new indication, uh, what are the, the roles of administration and so forth. If you look at the 505B1, this is really the most complicated or cumbersome or complete or comprehensive NDA you can do. Okay, so this is the hardest, I'll say. 
And if you look at the ANDA, which is your generic, this is probably the simplest, easiest one that you could do. So these are two ends of the spectrum. And the 505B2 NDA is probably right in the middle. You know, you've got, you can draw from the existing drug, but you're making some changes on it. So you've got something that's unique to the marketplace. Um, and as a result, you get some exclusivity there. So not five years, but at least, uh, you know, three to five years where you can see that you don't get really much here with the ANDA. Okay, so do you need to have a pre-NDA meeting? And I think, you know, by now I'm going to say, yes, it's highly recommended. And, you know, there are lots of, uh, you know, I, I would say most people would agree that you need a pre-NDA meeting. You are going to have to allow time for this. But this, again, is another chance to have open dialogue with the FDA and the division within the FDA that you're going to be submitting your NDA to. And as much um, forthcoming information that you give the FDA about what you're going to be doing and what you're planning to submit, the more buy-in you can get from them and also the more advice that you can get from them. So here I've highlighted um, just some of the key things to look for in the pre-NDA meeting um, that you might want to discuss. And you, again, can go there with specific questions. You can talk about, you know, how you're planning to present the information. You can discuss what needs to go into your um, labeling, um, some concerns that you might have seen from the clinical trials that maybe you have questions about, um, anything along those lines. So this is really the best chance and one of the most important meetings you can have with the FDA to get their feedback because you want that NDA to get approved and you want to move forward. You've probably got you know, an NDA submission date and hopefully an approval date down the line. You've got a sales force waiting to get started. Maybe you've got um, a partner ready to, to partner with you, or perhaps, you know, you're getting ready to um, do some market access and, and some other planning and all that's waiting on the line. So you can't really afford to have your NDA fail. It's extremely costly. So this pre-NDA meeting is all that more critical for that reason. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the pre-NDA, pre-BLA timeline. So uh, again, the BLA is our biologic version of the NDA, and the pre-NDA application um, really has a similar timeline to the pre-IND application. So you're going to look at the top of this continuum, and that's what the FDA guidelines are. And then at the bottom of this continuum is what the sponsor should be doing. And you'll see that once you've requested your pre-NDA meeting, you have 21 days to um, basically receive a response from the FDA that says your meeting's been granted and it's 60 days from now. And once that happens, you're going to have to put together your pre-NDA package or your pre-BLA package. So again, you want to have about 80% of that pre-NDA or pre-BLA package done before you do that meeting, if possible. So um, again, you're going to want to work backwards from a timeline. So you're going to go out here and say, okay, here's when I want to submit my NDA. Let's work backwards all the way to the pre-NDA meeting so that you can allow enough time for these types of activities. And again, this pre-NDA meeting is probably going to be written correspondence or teleconference or a virtual meeting with the FDA. And that's going to enable... Um, them to provide you with that feedback that you're looking for. So, you know, what should I be doing? Um, what, what regulatory requirements am I not thinking about? Uh, what information for my clinical trials do I need to include that I didn't think about? Um, and really heed or, or take the FDA's advice, which some people say is kind of like a mandate, seriously. Um, don't not listen to the FDA. I mean, you're putting this out there. They're going to give you good advice and real specific advice. So definitely heed to that advice. And then after the meeting, about 30 days after the meeting, you're going to get your meeting minutes that you, you can use to shape your NDA further. Okay. So the NDA table of contents. So um, again, if uh, if this is a new drug, et cetera, you're going to be putting this in the ECTD format. So this is our electronic common technical document that's really fun to put together. Um, you are going to have uh, your forms and the administrative pieces up front. 
your summaries and your summaries are going to be the CMC section, which is again going to be a very large section of the NDA that's going to have all the chemistry and manufacturing. It's got the drug uh, formulation, et cetera. And then now you're going to have all your non clinical studies here, but you know, probably in more detail than you did with the IND. Um, you're going to have the non clinical literature. Um, it, it may be the FDA told you in the pre NDA meeting or pre BL meeting that you needed to shape it a certain way. Um, and show some particular uh, animal studies and what they represent. Um, so you want to do that. And the clinical section now, module five, is going to be a lot larger. So this is going to have um, all of your clinical studies that you've performed, the results of those studies, all the clinical literature associated with your drug, um, all the safety and efficacy information is going to be summarized here. And so this clinical section is going to be much larger than it was in the IND for obvious reasons. Um, and don't forget, you're going to be including your label. Um, and so your label is going to have all the information that pertains to labeling. That could be like, oh, the safety updates, drug abuse information, patient information, um, any data from the studies that might have said, you know, side effects, uh, that type of thing. So you want to make sure that you spend a lot of time making sure that that label and package insert is correct um, and, you know, how to administer the drug is included, all the formulations and dosages that are available, um, any potential adverse reactions, et cetera. Okay, so the NDA timelines, how long does it take to prepare an NDA? And I would say uh, this says 12 to 18 months. I would recommend two years if you can do it. Um, the NDA process and the overall prep process is something that's always ongoing as you get more CMC information. As you modify your chemical, you know, CMC information, you're going to want to start inputting it into the NDA. As you complete your clinical uh, trials and studies, you're going to want to start putting it into the NDA. So the fresher and uh, the more I guess the sooner you do an activity and the sooner you get it into the NDA or start thinking about the NDA, the better off you're going to be because the information is fresh and you can summarize it best. You're going to be doing a lot of statistical analyses and summaries, et cetera. So you're going to want to allow time for all of that. Um, sometimes you just don't have those resources. So then go outside and get them, get assistance from folks who are CMC experts, folks who've worked with the FDA before in that therapeutic area. Um, folks who know how to summarize the, the clinical studies and um, know how to do the risk evaluations and can look at the safety and efficacy and the non-clinical literature and, and help you put all this together. And perhaps you think you know how to put it together, but you'd like a second set of eyes. By all means, get a second set of eyes to review that information. Make sure it's presented. Your regulatory strategy is clear. Um, the package insert makes sense. You haven't forgotten anything. Uh, those types of things. All the, all the advice that you got from the FDA has been incorporated in there. Um, and don't forget again about publishing. Publishing takes time. So you're going to want to allow time for publishing at least two to three weeks before the submission date. You should have everything done. But usually you're going to want to piecemeal that publishing. So if you work with somebody that has like a regulatory expertise and then publishing in-house, that's great because they can piecemeal it over to the publishing department um, as it gets done. Okay, so what is uh, the review time for the FDA uh, to look at your NDA. So 14 days after you submit your NDA, um, you're going to get an acknowledgement letter from the FDA saying, hey, we got it. And then 60 days after the NDA, the FDA is going to review the NDA to determine, is it complete enough for us to actually officially review it? So those 60 days are a nice, long, fun wait time for you. Um, you have to basically wait 60 days to hear is the package good enough for them to review? If it's not, you're going to get it sent back. If it is, then you're going to be waiting now. And there are two types of reviews that we need to discuss here. So there's what we have a standard review. So that's uh, NDAs that don't represent uh, anything in terms of like 
uh, an advance in the treatment of the disease. And in those cases, the FDA is going to take 10 months to review that, that drug. And if it's a BLA, it actually takes longer. I'm not exactly sure why, but for 12 months, uh, you need to allow the FDA to review that. If it's priority review, uh, that's for a new drug that's um, somehow making a significant improvement in patient lives or a particular therapeutic or therapy area or disease state. Um, and a lot of drugs go for the priority review. Um, they don't always get it, and sometimes it's not always applied, but um, this means the FDA has to get back to you in six months. And I will say, you know, ever since way back when AIDS was out there, there's been more efforts from the FDA to do priority reviews, to try not to, to stall that review process. But also, you no, know, because of COVID and because of the influx of COVID drugs, uh, the FDA is also overwhelmed with the amount of NDAs and INDs and BLAs that they have to review that uh, you just need to allow time here. But um, these are the timelines associated with the priority review and BLA takes eight months to review. So again, things to take into consideration. Um, we know these as our PDUFA dates, if you will. Um, so you're paying the FDA a prescription drug user fee and uh, you're waiting for your okay moment so that once you get that go ahead, you can launch your product, get your sales force selling it and so forth. So there are a couple of responses that you could get from the FDA here. One and the ideal one is that great approval letter. And that's effective the date the letter comes out. And then the second one is what they call a complete response letter. And in that letter, um, you're going to want to um, heed to what the FDA says. They're going to be telling you about some deficiencies, and you're going to have to correct those and resubmit your NDA. So not exactly the best news and certainly going to be costly for you to do that. Uh, the, the letter you don't want to get is that we refuse to file this all together. So that means you have to pay those PDUFA fees again, which uh, they're they're expensive, and then you have to uh, basically start over. And here are just reasons why the FDA might refuse incomplete application, lack of required information, um, just not in the right format, didn't listen to what they said. There could be several things here. Um, so this is just some examples of what those are. Okay, so now we're toward the end of our drug approval process. Um, we have the drug approved, right? So what do we have to do now? Well, we're going to have to report any adverse events as they occur. Um, for 18 months, you're going to have to tell the FDA uh, 18 months or after approval of the drug, you have to do these safety evaluations or after it's used by 10,000 individuals, whichever is later. Um, they're going to be performing inspections on your facility and you don't know when that's going to occur. So you could have like a mock audit done. So you're prepared for that. You're going to need to register your drug. And if you didn't know, you need to license your drug in select states before you can sell it really. So um, there's a uh, whole state licensing services that are available that can help you determine, you know, what states are needed for a drug. There's also different state rules for OTC and med device. So these other parts in yellow are still more regulatory ongoing. Okay, so let's highlight regulatory costs. And I will say that this may not be all the regulatory costs, and it certainly doesn't include the employees uh, that, that work for you or some of the overhead you might have related. But this is based on my knowledge of some of the costs that are involved in regulatory. So you have the IND prep. And in this cost estimate, I've included the writing, the review, all the meetings like that pre-NDA meeting or IND meeting, excuse me, um, the maintenance and the publishing. So all of that's included in this 350,000. And you could use this costing structure uh, as a way to obtain funding or as a budget to help you determine how much it, you, know, you need to spend and have in house to cover all of your bringing it to the market NDA piece. So you've got your NDA prep and that's 850,000. It could be less if you're doing your own writing. Um, it could be less if you're doing an ANDA, of course. So the type 
of NDA that you do. And, uh, you know, 505B1, B2, and so forth is going to play into the pricing here. And then the amount of uh, resources you have in-house will as well. Um, if you're always good to have regulatory consulting budget because you might have some CMC issues that come up um, and you want to address those issues. And so to do that, uh, you, you might need to call on an expert. So allow some funding for that. And then the labeling, I know it's about 60, 65,000 for drug labeling for a clinical trial. I really don't know what it, how much the package insert is for um, an NDA and, and the final uh, drug, but, uh, you know, allow some costs here. Um, you also got your safety reporting. I know just the publishing piece is like 15,000, um, so allow for some of that safety reporting numbers. Um, also state licensing, uh, you're gonna have to uh, set up registration initially with at least 36 states, and then you're gonna have to renew that registration every year. So the setup's about 45,000, could be less, depending on um, what kind of drug you're, you're developing and so forth. Um, that's a subtotal there. That's over a million dollars, but then you have your lovely PDUFA fees. So these are the fees that are charged by the FDA if a clinical trial is required and, and the application fee if there's no clinical trial and then there's a program fee. And if your, FD, your NDA does not go through and they send it back to you, you have to eat these costs and pay them again. So you don't want to go through that. You don't want to be refused your NDA, that would cost you a lot of money. So this is just a guideline to give you a feel for what some of those costs are, because I get a lot of this question all the time. Um, I know we're running um, close to the end and we're, we're almost done with the presentation here. Just a couple pitfalls to, to uh, avoid in developing a drug. And I'm just gonna highlight uh, some of these. The first one is intellectual property. Uh, sometimes biotechs don't really think strategically about their licenses or their patents, um, both that they own or what they'll have to license from others. So, you know, how strong is your patent protection? How will a buyer or partner view the terms and conditions of your license? What if you're planning to develop not just in the U.S., but Europe or Asia? How does that play into your, your intellectual property and protection? So things to consider. Obviously, money. Um, Drug development takes a lot of money. Make sure you have it. If you're going to do it in stages, try to do it in a way that doesn't disrupt the work that you're doing in your NDA or IND timelines. Um, regulatory strategy, I can't stress this enough. Do it early on. Try to get the, the best expertise you can. It's out there. Use it. Always try to get at least a second set of eyes to review it, to help vet out your regulatory strategy. It's really helpful to have experts who know their way around the FDA and have relationships with the FDA. Um, so if you can uh, find those people and they can help you, uh, that's a big, big plus for you. Um, and then when it comes to the FDA, listen to the FDA. It's critical that you use these pre-IND meetings and these pre-NDA meetings and the end of phase two meetings to develop this rapport with the FDA, to get their feedback and let them know how you're doing, and then to take that feedback. You know, um, like I said, sometimes it's not just a suggestion, it might be a mandate. So please follow um, you know, the advice that you're given. Um, lastly, I just want to say uh, something about CROs. Um, I've worked for three CROs. I worked for IQVIA, I've worked for ICON, and I've worked for Covance. And I can tell you that they are experts at clinical research, you know, finding the sites, recruiting the patients, all those things are fantastic. What they're not really necessarily good at is regulatory, meaning it's not their sweet spot. That's not the only thing they do. So with a CRO, um, particularly if you're a large farmer, you're going to get a lot of attention because you're paying a lot of money and they're going to throw in the regulatory. But if you're a smaller biotech, um, you know, there are complaints that you don't get as much attention, that the regulatory falls by the wayside because it's not their primary focus. So just keep that in mind. Um, there's three types of regulatory support. You could go get your own consultant. OK, and they could be a specialist in INDs or NDAs, but they may not be a CMSC expert. So, you know, you you might have to go outside anyway and get additional help. You could go to the other spectrum and get a CRO. And I talked about the positive and negatives there. Um, 
at Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences, we do more of uh, just regulatory, but we have 200 plus scientists on staff. So they know all the different disciplines like non-clinical, clinical, and CMC, and they've worked with various therapeutic areas. Um, and so they're cross-functional. You can easily get, you know, regulatory affairs to work with publishing and so forth. So there are some advantages to have someone who's just specialized in regulatory services, which is what I would consider the sweet spot. Here's a list of our services as an FYI. And then here's my list of the helpful resources. So um, I actually have a, an email that I can send you with these PDFs or I'd be sure to leave it with Joan or someone from um, the AZ Bio Group for you all to have along with a copy of my presentation. And then lastly, there is a part two series coming up. And um, these are some topics that I thought might be helpful. I would welcome your input on this expedited programs you want to talk about different types of meetings um, those things be happy to help i see joan there i'm back hi so Dave. first of all gail thank you this You're was welcome. absolutely terrific and i'm really looking forward to to part two um we did have just a couple of questions in the chat so um just to capture those um question number one was you know as we go from like phase one to phase two in our yep. trial do we need to have fda permission to proceed no um you can talk about that in phase uh in the pre ind meeting but you don't need their permission to go from phase one to phase two you do if there's been a lot of changes uh at the end of phase two then the fda is probably going to want an end of phase two meeting but no you don't need their permission terrific and you know we looked at, at the um costs yes. and your cost slide um and then we talked earlier about you know for especially a blockbuster buck type of drug that's going to have a large population we could be looking at 2.6 billion dollars oh yeah so we saw the FDA fees, those are in the millions of dollars. The regulatory costs are in the millions of dollars. Right. Where is the majority of that money? Um, yeah, so the reason that um, the drug development costs are so high is most of it, a lot of it falls into the actual development piece. So, you know, uh, putting together the manufacturing and putting together uh, a lot of the, the studies particularly the clinical research study phase three is extremely expensive because you're going on a bigger audience of patients, if you will, and it might have to be over several years. And I know just from working at a CRO, those studies are could be 80, $90 million. I mean, they're very, very expensive. So relatively speaking, I would say regulatory is a much smaller piece, but I'm not sure. I would say I probably didn't account for some of the resources that you might need um, and some of the, you know, determining regulatory strategy up front. I mean, you could be dipping in and out of regulatory. That's this is more of kind of the hard cost for the IND and the NDA, but there's probably other costs in there. Okay, great. Well, again, Gail, thank you so much for a terrific presentation. We are looking forward to part two next month. Okay. And, um, for all of our AZ Bio team members, this session has been recorded. So if you need to go back and look at things, we'll make that available, as well as um, Dylan will have copies of Gail's materials. And you can reach him at dylan at azbio.org, and he'll be happy to help you. Yeah, so my that, contact information is there too. So if you need to reach out for anything, happy to share. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. And we'll see you for part two in February. Bye-bye.